knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. If Earth's geological history were a book, sedimentary rocks would make up most of the pages. Much of what we know about the evolution of life on Earth is based on observations of the fossil record from sedimentary rocks. For the siliciclastic rocks we discussed in the previous tutorial, living organisms are analogous to the book's editor. They aren't responsible for the rock's formation, but modify them in several ways, such as digging burrows or leaving behind fossils. However, moving on to biogenic rocks, with these, living organisms assume the role of author, publisher, and editor. That is not to say that other depositional processes, such as rounding and sorting, aren't in operation, but simply that biological processes assume leading roles. Most of the grains in biogenic sedimentary rocks are ultimately derived from the skeletal material of organisms, which may or may not be modified by transport. This tutorial will focus on carbonate rocks since they are by far the most abundant type of biochemical rocks. You may know carbonate rocks by another name, limestone, which is a general term used for rocks composed mainly of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate crystallizes as two polymorphs, or minerals with the same chemistry but different structure, those being calcite and aragonite. Over much of geologic history, calcite has been the main carbonate mineral to form in Earth's oceans, though there have been times where aragonite crystallized instead. In fact, we are currently living in a time of aragonite seas, where aragonite is the main carbonate mineral that precipitates from seawater. Whether marine sediments are dominated by aragonite or calcite depends on the magnesium to calcium ratio of seawater. This ratio varies throughout time and is mainly controlled by the magnitude of mid-ocean ridge volcanism, sometimes described as the rate of seafloor spreading. Hydrothermal reactions that take place near mid-ocean ridges enrich seawater in calcium and deplete it in magnesium. For example, plagioclase exchanges its calcium for sodium in seawater, becoming more sodium-rich in a process called albitization. The more volcanism at the ridge, the smaller the magnesium-calcium ratio will be. We currently have aragonite seas because the rate of seafloor spreading is relatively slow, which has been the case for about the last 25 million years. When seawater is more concentrated in magnesium, it favors the crystallization of aragonite, which forms metastably, while calcite is actually the more thermodynamically stable phase. The progressive addition of magnesium to seawater decreases the nucleation rate of calcite, and when the molar ratio of magnesium to calcium surpasses about 5, calcite nucleation is so restricted that aragonite forms metastably instead. This has important implications. For example, some marine taxa build tissues from aragonite, others calcite, and as Earth's oceans fluctuate between calcite and aragonite seas, it exerts a selective pressure on organisms. Times of aragonite seas favor organisms that build tissues from aragonite. Calcite seas favor organisms that build tissues from calcite. Additionally, aragonite is unstable both at surficial and burial conditions, and readily recrystallizes to calcite during diagenesis. So, sediment that was initially deposited as aragonite almost always displays replacement textures. The carbonate minerals are relatively soluble and are prone to recrystallization during burial, which sometimes destroys valuable depositional textures that geologists use to interpret a rock's history. Though sometimes, original textures can be preserved as ghosts, where the outlines of original grains are visible. In addition to calcite and aragonite, another common carbonate mineral is dolomite, which has the chemical formula CaCO3-MgCO3. It is essentially calcite that had half of its calcium replaced with magnesium. Dolomite is prevalent in the geologic record, but has never been observed to precipitate in the modern oceans, even though seawater is saturated with respect to dolomite. This is known as the dolomite problem. Therefore, geologists believe that most dolomite was probably formed by the reaction of calcite with magnesium-rich basinal fluids during diagenesis. Calcite, aragonite, and dolomite make up about 90% of the minerals in biogenic rocks, with the majority being calcite. 
Because of this, biogenic rocks are mainly classified based on their texture, which we will cover next. Most carbonate sediment is ultimately derived from the skeletal material of organisms. Any organism that builds body parts from calcium carbonate contributes to the pool of biogenic sediment. Consequently, carbonate grains come in all shapes and sizes, from the microscopic exoskeletons of coccolithophores to the gravel-sized shells of bivalves. Additionally, skeletal materials are often abraded to some degree during transport, where they are broken down and rounded, just like any other sediment. Furthermore, carbonate sediment can be reworked by benthic, or bottom-dwelling organisms, creating a wide assortment of grain shapes and textures. Let's now discuss the different types of carbonate grains and how they're formed. The first and most abundant type are skeletal fragments. In this context, skeletal fragments refer to identifiable pieces of organisms, including entire fossils and broken fragments of them. Fossils representing all the major phyla of calcareous marine invertebrates are present in carbonate rocks. The types of skeletal fragments found in a limestone is dependent on both the age and the environment in which it was deposited. Obviously, you wouldn't expect to find trilobites in a limestone that formed either before they evolved or after they went extinct. Since the carbonates are the most fossiliferous of the rocks, geologists often use limestones to interpret the depositional environment in which a rock was formed. For example, a limestone containing coral fossils would be interpreted to have formed in a shallow marine environment, since they rely on a symbiotic relationship with photosynthetic algae to survive. Next, there is microcrystalline calcite, also called micrite, or carbonate mud. It is texturally analogous to siliciclastic mud, making up the matrix fraction of the rock, and encompassing all carbonate grains smaller than silt. Most carbonate mud in the geologic record is probably biogenic, mainly being composed of broken-down calcareous algae such as halimeda and protist exoskeletons such as coccolithophores. However, carbonate mud has been observed to inorganically precipitate in modern marine environments in the form of aragonite needles. Geologists are uncertain as to exactly how much of the carbonate mud in the rock record was inorganically derived. Carbonate mud can take on different morphologies, making the basis for several other types of carbonate grains. For example, ooids form when carbonate mud precipitates, often concentrically, around a nucleus of some sort, such as a skeletal fragment or grain of quartz sand. Ooids are observed to form in wave-agitated shallow waters that are enriched in dissolved calcium carbonate. When ooids are larger than 2 mm, they are called pyzoids. Pelloid is a term used to describe aggregates of carbonate mud, typically forming silt to sand-sized particles. The most common type of pelloids are fecal pellets, which are produced by organisms that ingest carbonate mud on the sea floor. They digest the organic matter in the mud and excrete the inorganic materials as fecal pellets. They tend to be oval-shaped and uniform in size. Next, there are aggregate grains, which are like pelloids, but are instead composed of larger grains held together by carbonate mud. That covers the main types of primary biogenic carbonate. There are two more types of carbonate grains found in limestone. The first are lithoclasts, which are similar to lithic fragments, which we covered in the tutorial on siliciclastic rocks. Lithoclasts are composed of lithified clasts of carbonate rock that can either be derived from outside the depositional basin, called extraclasts, or from inside the basin, called intraclasts. The final type of carbonate grain isn't sediment at all, but rather describes a crystalline texture known as sparry calcite. Sparry calcite often forms as cement within the pore space of carbonate sediment, but can also form from the recrystallization of primary carbonate grains during diagenesis. 
Now that we have an understanding of what makes up carbonate rocks, we can start classifying them. The classification of carbonate rocks can be a bit confusing. Not only does it use a completely different scheme than siliciclastic rocks, but there are two completely different systems used, both being based on the rock's texture. We will focus on the classification system of Folk from 1962. It is based on the relative abundances of carbonate grains, carbonate mud, and sparry calcite cement. For example, if a limestone contains more carbonate mud than sparry calcite cement, it is classified as micrite. If instead it has more sparry calcite, it is classified as sparite. Next, you determine the dominant type of carbonate grain present, if any. A rock composed entirely of carbonate mud is simply called micrite. If the carbonate grains are dominated by ooids, add the prefix u to the first term. So a rock composed of ooids with abundant sparry calcite cement would be classified as an usparite. Other modifiers based on the type of carbonate grain are bio for skeletal fragments, pel for pelloids, and intra for intraclasts. So a biosparite refers to a rock dominated by skeletal fragments and sparry calcite cement. A palmicrite refers to a rock dominated by pelloids and carbonate mud. And an intrasparite refers to a rock dominated by intraclasts and sparry calcite cement. These terms are all used to describe carbonate rocks whose sediment was transported prior to deposition. These transported grains are called allochems. Sometimes carbonate rocks are deposited in place, as is the case for coral reefs. They are classified as biolithites. It is not uncommon for sedimentary rocks to consist of a mix of carbonate and siliciclastic grains. In this scenario, the modifiers calcareous or silicious are added to its classification. For example, a sandstone containing subordinate carbonate grains would be classified as a calcareous sandstone. A limestone with subordinate grains of quartz sand would be called a silicious limestone. Furthermore, additional modifiers can be added to further describe the rock's texture, such as the ratio of matrix to carbonate grains. A carbonate rock that is grain-supported is said to be packed. If it has between 10 and 50% matrix, it is said to be sparse. Other terms such as sorted and rounded can also be applied. Carbonate rocks are sometimes given informal names, such as chalk or coquina. Chalk is a type of fine-grained carbonate rock composed almost entirely of nanofossils, such as foraminifera. Coquina refers to an uncompacted carbonate rock composed mainly of poorly sorted skeletal fragments. Like the siliciclastic rocks, inferences can be made about the depositional environment based on textural properties, such as grain size and the degree of rounding and sorting. Rocks consisting of carbonate mud are analogous to siliciclastic mudstones, requiring calm waters to be deposited. A limestone consisting of rounded and sorted skeletal fragments would be interpreted to have formed in a high-energy environment, such as a wave-agitated shoreline. Furthermore, the rounded and sorted nature of the grains indicates that the sediment has been transported a moderate distance. Before moving on, there is one more type of biogenic rock to discuss, which is called chert. Chert is a general term used to describe ultra-fine-grained siliceous sedimentary rocks that are mainly composed of microcrystalline quartz. In modern environments, most chert is formed on the seafloor, though it also occurs in some lake deposits, especially those that are hydrothermally active. The formation of chert begins with the deposition of a type of sediment that geologists call siliceous ooze. Oozes are gel-like sediments that contain a sizable fraction of the microscopic exoskeletons of planktonic protists. Being siliceous oozes, these sediments are composed of organisms that build skeletal materials from silica rather than calcium carbonate, as in the White Cliffs of Dover. For the most part, siliceous skeletal materials are produced by two main groups of organisms, diatoms and radiolarians. Diatoms comprise a large portion of Earth's biomass and are responsible for 20-50% to 50 of global annual oxygen production. 
Additionally, some types of sponges build structural components, or spicules, from silica, also contributing to the pool of silicious ooze. It is important to note that the silica these organisms build is not crystalline. It is a hydrated, amorphous form of silica called opal A. Most probably know of opal as a type of gemstone. Geologists currently think that most, if not all, silicious ooze is biogenic. This is because, on average, modern oceans are grossly undersaturated with respect to both quartz and amorphous silica. Thus, biologic assistance is the only viable way to precipitate large amounts of silica in Earth's oceans. If you think about it, it is impressive that organisms can build skeletal tissues using a material that should dissolve in seawater. They escape dissolution by using various active protective systems, which obviously shut off after death. So, why don't the skeletal fragments dissolve when the organism dies? Well, they often do, but not always. Silicious oozes are most abundant in today's oceans in areas where there is upwelling. Upwelling transports deep, nutrient-rich waters toward the ocean surface, increasing biological productivity and inflating radiolarian and diatom populations. If there are enough organisms dying and sinking to the bottom, then the accumulation rate of silicious skeletal material can overcome the rate of dissolution, leading to the formation of a silicious ooze deposit. Silicious oozes are later converted to chert during diagenesis, owing to the increased pressures and temperatures associated with burial, which drives the crystallization of opal A into quartz. Chert has a crypto-crystalline texture, meaning that it is so fine-grained that its crystalline nature is only vaguely revealed in thin section or a microscopic slide made of rock. Chert sometimes occurs as nodules in other sedimentary rocks, especially limestone. Nodular chert is thought to form via diagenetic replacement of the original rock. This would occur in areas of the basin that develop silica-rich pore waters, supplied by the dissolution of silicious oozes at the sea floor, which can later seep into the sediment pile. Chert is classified based on whether fossils are present, the types of fossils present, and whether it is bedded or nodular. Jasper is a type of red chert, which gets its color from the mineral hematite. Flint is a name given to chert that forms as nodules in limestone and can be a variety of colors. Chert has historically been used for stone tools, especially those that require a sharp edge. Its ultra-fine-grained nature and high hardness allow it to be formed into a sharp, durable blade. And with chert covered, that wraps up biogenic sedimentary rocks. Let's move on to the final category of sedimentary rocks, chemogenic rocks. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.